when you're in a law school, you really don't know <clears throat> what direction your your uh, legal career is going to take. And when I was at Cornell Law School, I thought that I was going to have a career in uh, trusts and estates and things of that kind, writing wills. And, and in over 60 years as a lawyer, do you know how many wills I have written? How oh, many? One. <laughs> On my graduation from Cornell Law School, the, the um, Korean War had started, so I went back in the Navy uh, and I was assigned to the USS St. Paul. The St. Paul came in to Sasebo, Japan, for a few days, and we received a uh, all ships message to send somebody ashore to defend two sailors who were accused of murdering a rickshaw driver and never tried any case at all. And now I have the responsibility of defending these two sailors in a murder case. And there's no question that they had been in an altercation with the, with the rickshaw driver. The clues were very, very interesting. The, the story of, about the proof is fascinating and one of the interesting aspects of it was uh, the Japanese witnesses uh, and uh, the, my total inability to cross-examine, let's say, a simple question like, well, what did he say? And then there would be a conversation in Japanese between the interpreter and the witness which might go on for three or four minutes, and finally the interpreter would turn to the court and to me and say, uh, he really didn't say anything. And that would be his answer. To make a long story short, uh, I was successful in getting them off on the murder charge, and they were convicted of manslaughter first degree. When I first started... Uh, practicing law, the lawyers were much more collegial. That It was a smaller group. You trusted each other. A uh, handshake, if you settled a case, you did it with a handshake, and uh, no one ever questioned it. Within 10 years of entering the office, Hancock, uh, I sort of started what I call my meteoric political career, like a meteor in that sort of a, a very bright uh, light and then all goes dark. And uh, so, but I had a wonderful time. I thought that I detected a groundswell for me to run uh, to regain the congressional seat which had been lost in the 1964 uh, landslide election. And uh, what happens often with aspiring candidates, what they may perceive to be groundswells, uh, turn out only to be ripples and so it was in my case. <laughs> in 1971, uh, the then Republican chairman called and said, you know, uh, uh, Judge Vanette had died, uh, Supreme Court Justice, and so there's a vacancy. And uh, I've been talking with many people and we want to submit your name to Governor Nelson Rockefeller to appoint you in his place. And I said, I, I've never thought about being a judge. Uh, I'd sort of checked to see if I did this as a Supreme Court justice, uh, whether I might go to the uh, appellate division and make a career as an appellate judge. 
And so you're never guaranteed about that. But I thought the chances looked pretty good. So I did it and uh, loved it. It turned out to be exactly the right thing for me to do. And I say facetiously uh, that I retired under a rule known as the rule of statutory senility. By statute, on the uh, 31st day of December of the year in which the judge, he or she, turns 70, the last stroke of midnight, perhaps having consumed a martini or two, who knows, on that last stroke, that judge is by statute senile, which means that... <laughs> The judge, that ex-judge, can no longer be a judge. But that does not stop the judge from going back and being a lawyer again. I think one of the most difficult cases um, that um, I had was after I <clears throat> got off the bench. And um, this was representing the New York State Senate in a lawsuit uh, brought by the governor against the Senate, Governor Pataki against the Senate and the Assembly. And uh, so this had to do with the power of the governor in the budget uh, being his power to <coughs> revise the budget which is submitted by the by the legislature. No question there's been a tremendous change and I think it's I think it's for the best. I remember my my father saying that uh, he appointed that he hired the first woman ever to be uh, uh, hired in a law firm in Syracuse and uh, that was considered a rarity. And, of course, that would have been just one woman, and that might have been, oh, good heavens, uh, 70, 80 years ago. I think we've reached reached the point where, where um, you don't ask a question at all. You just assume that the woman in the, in the position is just as good as any man in the position. You expect them to do just as well, and they do. I don't know. It's no longer a big deal. I tell them about my own own career, try to give them the upbeat, positive outlook. The career that I had has been has been right for me, and uh, I'm still doing it and enjoying it. Opportunities will come your way, and. Uh, you may say, can I do this? Am I up to this? Should I do it? And rightly or wrongly, rightly in my case, but I've always said, oh, well, <laughs> let's go for it.